Hello, and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. Introducing Rudderstack Profiles. Rudderstack Profiles takes the SaaS guesswork and SQL grunt work out of building complete customer profiles so you can quickly ship actionable, enriched data to every downstream team. You specify the customer traits, then Profiles runs the joins and computations for you to create complete customer profiles. Get all of the details and try the new product today at dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Rudderstack. You shouldn't have to throw away the database to build with fast-changing data. You should be able to keep the familiarity of SQL and the proven architecture of cloud warehouses, but swap the decades-old batch computation model for an efficient incremental engine to get complex queries that are always up to date. With Materialize, you can. It's the only true SQL streaming database built from the ground up to meet the needs of modern data products. Whether it's real-time dashboarding and analytics, personalization and segmentation, or automation and alerting, Materialize gives you the ability to work with fresh, correct, and scalable results, all on a familiar SQL interface. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash materialize today to get two weeks free. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Lucas Fittel about optimizing your database performance and tips for tuning Postgres. So Lucas, can you start by introducing yourself? Of course, yeah, and thank you for having me. So I'm Lucas Fiddle. I'm the founder and CEO of PG Analyze. Um, we help companies optimize their Postgres performance. Over the years, you know, I've spent a lot of time working with Postgres. So I kind of started out probably like 15 years ago now, probably more, um, <laughs> kind of lose track of times, 17 years, I think, um, using Postgres just as an application engineer myself. So my background is, you know, writing code, and I still like writing code these days. And back then, you know, I really struggled with how do I just make Postgres work better, essentially. How do I scale Postgres as an engineer? And so over the years, you know, I've kind of had different takes on how to approach that problem. For example, I was a part of a company called Citus Data that essentially did distributed Postgres, um, now part of Microsoft. And, you know, I kind of was using Postgres as an end user, essentially, in many cases as well. Um, companies like Product Hunt, for example. Now, over the last couple of years, I've been working on PG Analyze, which essentially helps people optimize their career workload better. I'd be happy to, you know, jump into some of these things, talk more about Postgres in this episode today. And you mentioned a little bit how you first started fighting with Postgres. I'm wondering if you can dig a bit more into how and why you decided to focus more into this area of data management and the database as a core concern of your career. Yeah, it's a good question. I think you know, initially I wasn't, I definitely wasn't an expert. I'm still not an expert these days in many ways, you know, like you always learn. But um, I do think, you know, it was, I, I was struggling with understanding, like even just getting a, men, a good mental model of how the database works, right? Like, like relational databases are often quite similar, like Postgres has a lot of similarities with MySQL, but then of course also divergences in like specific implementation details. But even just understanding basics like how a database takes your query and, you know, plans it and actually, you know, finds a good query plan and executes it and how the data kind of flows, you know, from indexes to kind of a result and gets joined together. I think initially I, I just didn't have a good mental model with, with that. And so I think what fascinated me back then when we kind of you know, started the first version of PG Analyze and what still fascinates me today is essentially providing ultimately better visualizations of performance information, right? So for me, it was always performance because like that's what that's what makes it actionable, right? Like it's interesting, of course, to visualize, you know, internal data structures and things like that, but that doesn't really have that urgency to it. And so performance work is interesting because you kind of, you have an actual issue you're trying to solve. And so I think what excites me really is the combination of, you know, something complex like performance optimization for a database combined with thinking about design and user experience and how you know, how you can visualize. So, I mean, this is a side note, but like one of the things that we did um, early in PG Analyze is we always wrote our own visualizations. So we don't use third party. I mean, we use D3, but we don't, you know, essentially do like a charting library or anything. We essentially have, you know, a, a very like purpose-built visualization um, logic and, and graphing logic um, because we felt that was important. Digging now into some of this aspect of database performance, performance tuning, I'm wondering what are some of the primary ways that performance problems can impact the business and ways that they might manifest in the runtime of an application that's using the database? I think ultimately it comes down to that if you think of this from an application perspective, it's a really slow function call most of the time, right? That function, you know, might be an ORM that you're calling. It might be, you know, a query that you wrote yourself and you're just executing, you know, the query directly. But it's kind of like you're doing, you know, connection dot execute or dot select or something, right? And then it's just really slow. And so I think the way it manifests for business, right, is that that ultimately is part of a bigger, you know, kind of customer experience, right? So somebody like accesses a website and the bottleneck is a SQL query that runs slow. And so 
the reason that you know everybody should care about it essentially right is because databases sit so central in in that whole overall experience right because basically anything that works with data has a database somewhere right and it postgres oftentimes is a system of records so you you know you, maybe if you have a cache you know in front of it but then there will be cases where the cache is missed and then you do have to think about those you know kind of tail latencies where you know things are either not in your own cache, like your Redis, for example, or maybe, you know, they're not even in the Postgres buffer cache, like the in-memory cache that Postgres has. And so then Postgres has to go to disk. And so it's really about these tail latency type of situations where I think it's become so important to, like, essentially think about how do I, how do I go from a slow query to understanding why it's slow? For people who are relying on the database, they're starting to see these challenges of slowness, performance. What are some of the issues that they might have, or what are some of the uh, challenges that they might experience trying to address performance problems where maybe they just try to say, oh, well, how do I make my application work better with the database? What are some of the core problems of performance engineering in a database context that application teams or even data teams are typically experiencing? I think to start with, people have, you know, this, I think, respect from the other database, right? So they kind of, they don't even want to go in, into the database because they're like, you know, it's this thing that I don't understand um, and it's just doing things, but I don't, I don't, it's not familiar essentially, right? So I think a lot of times, you know, when we do performance work for a database, I think we need to start by actually taking a leap of faith that we can do it, you know, that we can actually kind of go into it. And I like to think of ultimately databases as a software as well, right? Like it's it's software that, you know, in the case of like Postgres is fully open source, like you can just, if you really want to, you can figure out, you know, this query gets turned to this plan, gets turned into this executor function. So you can follow along essentially to understand what exactly is happening. And so I think it's really like to start with getting a, getting across that hurdle. But then, you know, obviously, I think most of the time, you know, performance work will involve like query plan optimization, right? So like, that's really where I think, and it's a skill you can learn, right? Like it's something that I think you just have to get into it and kind of like, like the most core, you know, kind of command you use in Postgres is explain. And so explain in Postgres gives you, it's actually, I think, pretty good compared to other databases. Like every now and then, like I saw a post yesterday where somebody was showing execution plans for like SQLite and I think uh, DuckDB and stuff, stuff like that. And they actually don't have as good and like as detailed as a format um, that the Postgres explain kind of shows because it's pretty good at telling you, you know, here is this plan node. Um, and if you do explain analyze, ideally with the buffers option, that tells you um, how long each part of the execution took. And so that really helps you kind of zoom in on your problem. Now I think what I would do then is I would try to understand how the data flows, right? So imagine you're like joining two tables and from one table, you have, you know, a thousand records from the other one, you have a million records. I would probably start by thinking, and, and actually, you know, let me add something to that. Um, you have a million records, but you're only using one of them, for example, right? So the, the, the most opportune low-hanging fruits are essentially the cases where you're fetching a lot of data from, you know, ultimately the file on disk, but you're not using it, right? You're discarding it because the database in worst case does a sequential scan, but oftentimes, you know, we do an index scan. The index scan maybe covers some of the conditions that, you know, you have in your where clause, but it doesn't cover all of them, which maybe you don't need to always, right? But essentially the problem is then, you know, database does a filter and kind of filters through data and does a lot of work to ultimately just give you that one row. And so I think that's where the execution plan is so important because it tells you that story. You mentioned that one of the challenges with performance might be related to the size of the tables, number of records, the, you know, given the number of records in a table, the number of records that you actually want. I'm curious, as you have worked as an application engineer, as you've worked on trying to optimize database performance, what are some of the common patterns that you see that typically lead to these performance errors that are maybe avoidable in terms of the application architecture and design and how much of it is just a factor of this is how databases work and you just have to figure your way around it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like that latter notion, you know, like it's just how it is. You just got to accept it. Um, sometimes that's true. I think in the simplest case, you know, it's understanding indexes is probably the most important thing, um, mostly because a lot of the easy problems are indexing problems, right? I mean, not, not easy, easy as in, you know, it's trivial, but it's something where if you're missing an index, then that's going to be very obvious in your execution plan. Now, I think there's one, this is very deep, like this is a very specific aspect of all I'll mention it since it was something that I didn't understand for a long time. I only understood this like two years ago. What matters, so imagine you have two tables and you're joining them 
and you, you want both of the situations to use an index, but one of the indexes is on your join condition. And so that works. You can definitely have indexes on join conditions in Postgres and you know use that index. And that's what's called a parameterized index scan, because what Postgres essentially does is it does a nested loop and it kind of inputs you know the variables into each index scan for kind of the outer values. But that's that's actually really hard to reason about because you need to look at your plan to understand is it actually doing that. And one thing I've learned over the years is that sometimes you don't you want that. Sometimes that's a very desirable behavior that you want that you know parameterized index scan with that nested loop. Sometimes you really don't want that. Sometimes what you should do instead is to add um, additional conditions to your queries. So it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but imagine you have a schema where let's say you have a customer ID on all your tables and you have like a multi-tenant, you know, shared tenancy type system. And so in that situation, you may query in a way where you're saying, let me get all the records from table A for this customer. And then for each of those records, let me find the associated records in the other table. But you're not adding the customer ID to that second table. You're just adding it to the first one. And sometimes that's a good choice, but sometimes it actually helps a lot to do it on both tables, essentially, right? So you essentially have where, you know, table A dot customer is something and then where uh, and table B customer is something. It's the exact same uh, customer ID kind of But what that helps the database do is use a different join method because it can then use a merge join or a hash join where it kind of gets the data for both of these and then joins it together versus having to get one of them first and then join into the other one. Um, and so it's, it's things like that, like understanding that that kind of stuff is hard to understand at first, but if you do it a lot, you see it all the time. <laughs> So like now when I look at the query plan, you know, it's one of the first things I'm trying to understand is, you know, is this the right join method? Should this be using a different join method? Because most of the time in relational databases, you'll see joins um, kind of happening. Another problematic pattern that I've seen happen a lot is things like N plus one queries, particularly when you're dealing with a web framework that has a built-in ORM and you're just naively saying, oh, I need this attribute, so I'll just go ahead and fetch it and not thinking through the fact that that actually means you're adding another query to an inner loop somewhere. And then all of a sudden you deploy it and wonder, oh my goodness, why did I suddenly go from 500 requests per second to five? (laughs) And I'm curious how much you've seen things like ORMs and application frameworks being used as a crutch, as a means of not having to understand how the database operates and some of the best practices around query patterns and some of the ways that maybe the industry is trending towards the pendulum swinging back towards actually living closer to the database and having the database be a first class consideration in the design and development of your application. Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, it's fascinating also, like, if you look at this from a community perspective, like when you talk to folks in the Postgres community, oftentimes they're very anti-ORM, I would say. <laughs> like a lot of people working in Postgres don't really don't really want to understand why people use ORMs. Um, and I emphasize with that, but I do think there is another you know side of the coin, which is, um, I think as an application engineer, it is very convenient, right? Like, it, like I don't want to write SQL all the time. Like even, you know, I and like my own code um, would use a combination of ORMs uh, and kind of, you know, raw SQL. And I think... It kind of it comes back to you know kind of taking that leap of faith and actually just doing some SQL <laughs> like it's not that hard essentially right I mean it is not not trivial but it is something where you want to if once you start looking at you know what SQL URL URM is generating and then feeling confident that you can just copy that and maybe modify it right then I think it's a good starting point for many folks I do think many ORMs generate suboptimal SQL but it has improved over the years so I, I would say that it, it depends a bit on which ORM we're talking about. But there are definitely cases still where you will get bad query plans because the ORM essentially does something nonsensical. I remember there was actually a patch recently that got into Postgres 17, which, if I recall correctly, has to do with self-joins, where essentially a table is joined against itself again. And ORMs, like these are the kinds of patterns where sometimes they make sense, right? But ORMs tend to do some of these things unnecessarily essentially and so there can be situations where the postgres planner for example gets confused because you're you're tr- telling it something very odd essentially right you're saying join with this table but you know don't really do it like like there's kind of you know this this, this kind of illogical kind of uh, query and so i think that's the situation where orms can be a problem is when they when they essentially cause a bad query plan because they're they're causing something you know to happen that you know you didn't actually mean to happen now, you touched a little bit on how that's changing, and I think it's really fascinating. Like, um, for example, one of the um, tools in the Go space is called SQL C. And so what SQL C does is um, it essentially compiles, um, like it, it does compile time or runtime, no, no, I'm sorry, 
build time checking would be the right term here, build time checking of your um, SQL queries. So the idea is you write SQL, you don't write around calls. And what SQL C does is it does um, a type check for you essentially. And so it generates, um, if I understand correctly, if I remember correctly, um, it generates the type definitions as well for you. And so you author SQL, but the SQL essentially becomes more than just the text, right? In your application code. And I think that's an interesting trend. There's like similar tooling for Rust as well where you are writing SQL, but then a SQL kind of integrates more deeply into your application by virtue of, you know, having the right types for querying it and such. And so I think that's, that's actually really exciting because it makes people more familiar with SQL, right? Like it makes it easier for them to, like if they, if the query is slow, they then can just put explain in front of it, right? As mentioned, or explain analyze buffers, um, and then, you know, understand why the query is slow. So they kind of, um, there's, like it removes this kind of um, invisible barrier that ORM sometimes add to performance work. Data lakes are notoriously complex. For data engineers who battle to build and scale high quality data workflows on the data lake, Starburst powers petabyte scale SQL analytics fast at a fraction of the cost of traditional methods so that you can meet all of your data needs, ranging from AI to data applications to complete analytics. Trusted by teams of all sizes, including Comcast and DoorDash, Starburst is a data lake analytics platform that delivers the adaptability and flexibility a lakehouse ecosystem promises. And Starburst does all of this on an open architecture, with first-class support for Apache Iceberg, Delta Lake, and Hoodie, so you always maintain ownership of your data. Want to see Starburst in action? Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Starburst and get $500 in credits to try Starburst Galaxy today. The easiest and fastest way to get started using Trino. And now digging into the manifestation of performance problems and the debug path, you mentioned the explain plan for uh, figuring out how is the database actually going to execute this query? What are some of the useful debug methods and signals for understanding how best to focus your efforts on addressing an underlying performance problem where do I need to change my code? Do I just need to deploy a bigger database instance? Do I need to restructure my tables, add indexes? I'm curious if you can talk through what that overall process looks like, uh, maybe generalized for any given database since most SQL databases have some of the same core problems or, or core methods for this approach, but also maybe specifics of where the Postgres database and ecosystem are adding better capabilities or adding tooling that simplify this process. Yeah, and I would say, you know, I would probably I think there's really two things to look at, right? It's like the individual latency of whatever you're trying to do. And then there's the overall kind of system utilization or system performance, right? So like and they often they interact with each other, right? So like if you have a lot of slow queries that will kind of bog down the whole system and so unrelated queries might get slow. And if the system is slow for some reason, it might even not be a query related issue, it might be some maintenance task the database is running, that you know also can, you know, like slow down your whole database essentially. I do like to, you know, kind of I think a lot of this actually comes back to more like understanding, you know, kind of the DevOps side or Linux kind of system administration side of this. Because it's really a question of, you know, which resources do you have and how is the database using them, right? And so oftentimes in the case of databases, that's I.O., right? So one of the most important things, I think, to understand about database performance at the high level, right, would be how is your I.O. stack set up and kind of, you know, how fast are your disks? What's the disk latency, right? So from your database server to the actual disk. Um, these days, you know, in the cloud, oftentimes that's uh, actually, you know, network um, kind of communication that has to happen. And so I think that oftentimes, I think, drives the, the big picture, right? Because if you have insufficient uh, kind of I.O. bandwidth or insufficient IOPS um, configured on your disk devices, um, then that will, you know, lead to bottlenecks. Now, so I, I would, you know, oftentimes actually say, you know, just look at whatever metrics your cloud provider has, or if you run your own on a virtual machine, use, you know, built-in Linux tooling just to understand, you know, what's actually happening on a on a system OS side, essentially. I do think that, you know, going from that to maybe a little bit what Postgres itself, for example, can offer. So like Postgres has many different subsystems, right? So like Postgres has, you know, auto vacuum, for example. Postgres has, you know, the wall where it kind of writes out the right ahead lock for crash recovery reasons and such. Um, and so... Sometimes it's important to understand what these other systems do. And especially, I think it's, it's less critical for read performance because for read performance, you can actually just look and explain plan. It will give you a good sense for what's going on. But especially for write performance, it becomes challenging to follow what's going on because Postgres, you know, like other databases that, you know, 
have the same issue, they won't like it won't just write your data right away to the disk, right? That wouldn't be fast, that wouldn't be performant. And so there is a lot of kind of ways how data is kind of kept, you know, in a temporary structure and then you know kind of it gets written to the ball, it gets written to a data directory. And so when you have issues with write performance, especially, then it becomes really important to understand, you know, am I bottlenecked on certain parts of the system, right? Like am I bottlenecked on how fast my wall and Postgres can be written out? One of the things that you know I am really excited about that um, so Postgres 16 came out a month ago, roughly, and what Postgres 16 has added is a new statistics view called PGStat.io. And PGStat.io is really interesting because it gives you um, essentially the database's view on its IO activities. So it tells you I'm the auto vacuum demon and I issued 500 IOs and I issued, you know, like them in this way because, you know, the, this stuff was not in memory, this was in memory, stuff like that, right? And so it becomes really helpful for understanding is my issue, you know, in the wall writing activity and the auto vacuum in the queries themselves, right? Um, and it's just, you know, like 20 rows of data. It's actually not a lot of data, but it's like if, like when you see, you know, which of the rows essentially gets flagged um, and you look at that over time, that's, I think, uh, will make Postgres performance work, you know, as once people upgrade to that new release, um, a lot easier because you kind of know where to, where to start. Another interesting aspect of performance and improving performance at the database engine level is in Postgres case, I know there are dozens, if not hundreds of configuration parameters that you can change for different aspects. Some of them require modifying multiple different parameters in concert to be able to have the desired effect. For anybody who is not deeply familiar with Postgres and all of its internals and everything about it and lots of its history, it can be quite intimidating to even start looking at what those configuration parameters are and how they're supposed to work. I'm wondering if you can talk to some of the ways that people can start to gain confidence in and understanding of those parameters and know where to start looking for tuning for performance to say, oh, I actually have a write heavy workload, so I want to change the way that Postgres does this specific sub operation because I don't need to be able to read as fast necessarily, or I'm willing to accept some latency in the writes to make sure that I that it's durable. I'm curious if you can just talk through some of that process of gaining familiarity with the various tuning parameters. Yeah, and I'll start by saying I think a lot of times people overestimate how bad the parameters are. Like people think that they have really inefficient parameters, but it turns out most of the time, especially when you're in a cloud provider, they kind of do a little bit of the tuning for you, right? So like on our Amazon RDS, for example, your like shared buffer setting is going to be contingent on the RAM. And, you know, of course, you know, sometimes you want to tune that shared buffer setting, but most of the time you don't necessarily need to start with that, right? And so I think a lot of times people think that they need to tune a lot of parameters, but I I would question that essentially. I would uh, question if that's really where the biggest problem is. Um, I do think that there are some, like there's some things the database can't know and you have to, you know, kind of tell the database what's okay with you essentially um, to happen to your data. I was talking to somebody recently about a very important setting in that regard, which is synchronous commit in Postgres. So synchronous commit essentially says when you're, um, like I'll, I'll mention this because I think it's it's one that I would actually think about changing myself if you have a write heavy workload in particular. So synchronous commit, what it controls is whether when you make a write, Postgres waits until the write actually has landed on disk to return back to you um, the results, right? To say yes, you successfully this was successfully written to disk. Now, if you turn that off, which you know I actually like to do in my systems, the effect of that is that in the worst case. What will happen is that you might lose a transaction in the case of a crash, right? So the worst case essentially is that you might lose something, but your database won't be corrupt. Your database will still be consistent. It will just be missing one of the data points. So if you're operating, you know, in financial services field, for example, you definitely shouldn't be turning that off <laughs> because you would want to make sure that, you know, when when your system that's writing the data into the, the database actually, you know, needs to have confirmation that it got there successfully. But in most cases, in most other systems, it's actually not as big of a problem um, to turn it off. And it does have a huge performance implication. Like a lot of internal systems can work more efficiently if they don't have to get that guarantee back to their client. And so I think that's one of the things I would look at. Maybe, you know, like in terms of, I think you asked a more broad question, which is, you know, how can I even think where to start? And so I would probably start by saying, look at the parameters, like synchronous commit is special because it kind of is on the right side of things, right? But again, coming back to a lot of times, read queries are, a little bit easier to, to to reason about because it's it's more isolated essentially in terms of how it works in the system, um, and so I would say starting by understanding 
there, there's some parameters that influence cost, like in the Postgres planner. The so Postgres planner is a cost-based system, right? So it makes like an, a certain calculations and says this is the best plan according to this cost. And one of the things, for example, that's you know really oftentimes not tuned these days, and unfortunately, Postgres still has a bad default there, um, is random page cost. So Postgres does you know random I/O, for example, when it does an index lookup, and Postgres has a way of estimating how much random I/O it's going to do for these index lookups. And it turns out by default, random page cost is set to four cost units, and sequential scan cost is set to one cost unit. And so that stark difference between the one and the four essentially defaults means that Postgres will oftentimes prefer not to do an index scan, which on modern hardware like you know an MVE SSD type hardware, it's actually not that expensive. And so tuning down the random page costs to be, you know, 1.1 or something, not one, but just slightly above one is usually good, um, is, is, a, is a good choice, right? And so that's the kind of stuff that I would look at is like anything that's planner related um, around costing, I think is good. Um, work mem is also good, like influences how much memory Postgres can use for career execution, things like that. In the process of tuning these parameters, obviously you don't want to go straight to your production instance and start changing things willy nilly. But as you are iterating through tuning these configuration settings, validating their effectiveness, what is a useful workflow that you found for being able to make sure that the change that you made is actually having the desired effect so that you don't end up in the space of, I think I'm doing the right thing, but I'm just getting frustrated. So I'm going to change five different things and hope that it all works. And then when it does function, I actually don't know which one did the thing that I wanted. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Uh, <laughs> I think, so some of the parameters you can actually change on a per connection basis. So for example, random page cost that I just mentioned, um, if I recall correctly, you can set that on a per connection basis. And so you could essentially say, if you have a bad query plan, right, you could say set random page cost equals 1.1, for example, in your connection, and it just changes for that connection. And then you can see, does that actually make the you know intended change? Um, and then, of course, you know at some point, you will want to roll it out to your whole database. But at that point, at least you've done some testing with maybe your most important queries. So I think if you can do that kind of testing, I think that's you know definitely recommended. I think the other thing I would look for is the, the most frustrating parameters to change are the ones that require a restart. So there are some parameters in Postgres where you have to restart the database for them to take effect. One example would be shared buffers. So shared buffers is like a fixed size allocation in Postgres. It says how big is Postgres's internal cache of sorts, like it's kind of working area um, for a lot of things in Postgres. And so changing that requires a restart. And so what I would probably try to do there, if I really tried to get to the right setting, is I would really try to get a good benchmark setup. And I would try to you know, work with a copy of your production database, ideally record some of the queries you run. I mean, this is where it gets tricky, right? Because there's no good tooling for that, unfortunately. But like record some of the queries you're running on your production, then against the clone, issue the same workload, ideally, right? Um, and then you know what's the best setting. Now, most of the time, that's a lot of effort. It's just not worth it. And so that's where people then, you know, go with a gut instinct and then make a change. And then, you know, maybe it's a good, maybe it's a bad change. It's essentially that question of, you know, like, like, is it worth the effort, right? Like, do you see a problem where you think that, you know, that contention in shared buffers is an issue? And so then I would actually do the benchmarking for those big settings that essentially can be hard to change. You mentioned at the beginning that you have been building PG Analyze as a way to make it easier to understand the performance characteristics of your queries, where you might need to make some of these changes. I'm wondering if you can talk through some of the journey that led you to the development of this project and ways that it can help in this process of identifying, this is what's going wrong with my database performance. This is how I'm actually going to address it. Sure. And I think I would start with saying, you know, it's like, I think the best software is written by people who have the problems themselves. And so that's, you know, how we wrote PG Analyze is, you know, it's just solving our own issues essentially um, with optimizing database performance. And so it, like it started really around query performance and saying which queries have executed on the database, like just showing you context on, hey, this is everything that has happened. We then expand that into showing you the execution plans as well. So in, in Postgres, there is an extension called auto explain, which essentially automatically will log slow execution plans. And so you can say, you know, if I have these outlier queries, um, then, you know, output it to the Postgres log. And so we have, you know, a pretty, you know, um, well working system these days that essentially picks up that data from the logs, um, links it together with the queries. And so I can just open up a query page and see the execution plans, which is huge because that's always a lot of work. And oftentimes you don't get the right plan because you're kind of looking at it after the fact versus seeing the actual time. But really what we've been getting into more recently is other ways to kind of help you optimize the workload by essentially giving you like what we call advisors that sit on top of, you know, the whole data that we're getting, right? So one of the challenges that I found is when I look at my queries and, you know, I have probably 
a couple of thousand unique queries in our system, it becomes hard, right? Like you can look at one query and understand what to optimize, but you can't look at a hundred queries and still keep that in your head. Like it just gets too complicated. And so the first advisor we launched about two years ago is the index advisor for Postgres. And so what index advisor does is it essentially looks at the workload, looks at, you know, the where clauses, the join clauses, and then says, you know, which of these is not, you know, covered by an index or which of these has an inefficient index scan. And the idea there is that it's not necessarily replacing a human thinking about this, right? So I still think that there's a human element in this, but it is essentially helping you work with a larger set of data much more easily because it kind of gives you an abstraction that we call scans, which is kind of each table, you know, has multiple scans based on you know, what the queries are doing. Um, and then for each of those scans, we essentially like run through different permutations of possible indexes and then give you recommendations on what we think is missing. And so that, you know, essentially the, the goal here is to make that work more easily for either the you know data engineer or the application engineer working with the database. They can kind of get a good first assessment of where they might need to spend time. This episode is brought to you by Datafold, a testing automation platform for data engineers that finds data quality issues before the code and data are deployed to production. Datafold leverages data diffing to compare production and development environments and column level lineage to show you the exact impact of every code change on data, metrics, and BI tools, keeping your team productive and stakeholders happy. Datafold integrates with DBT, the modern data stack, and seamlessly plugs in your data CI for team wide and automated testing. If you are migrating to a modern data stack, Datafold can also help you automate data and code validation to speed up the migration. Learn more about Datafold by visiting dataengineeringpodcast.com slash datafold today. So one of the things that you just pointed out is this setting that will allow you to log queries that are deviations from the norm. And if you don't already know about this or you're not familiar with Postgres, you don't know to make that change to log those queries. And so when you do run into the performance errors and you're trying to find some common thread to be able to address it, you're not going to be able to have that information at hand. So as you are deploying a new Postgres instance, what are some of the things that you always make sure to change because you want to be able to have that information when you need it, rather than saying everything's not working, but now in order to get the things that I need to know, if I first have to make a bunch of changes and then wait. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. So I think the, so the two things I would always enable, so coming back to, you know, some settings are harder to change. So you should change the settings early that, you know, are hard to change. So you don't have to restart the database later. And so um, there's two extensions that are bundled with Postgres that are kind of part of what Postgres calls Contrib that it would always enable. Um, the first one is PG stat statements. Um, so PG stat statements collects the query statistics. And that's um, something you can always turn on on production systems. Like I've not seen, well, I mean, there's some edge cases, but like, let's just say for the most part, I've not seen any performance issues at all with that. And so it's it's just something that really gives you a lot of details around, you know, just which queries have executed. So PG stat statements, I would turn that on. I would add that to shared preload libraries, which is the setting that requires to restart. So I would make sure to make that change. For most production systems, I would also enable auto explain, which we just referenced. Um, which you know locks the slow query execution plans. Now, auto explain has the same way as PHS statements has settings that control whether it's actually running, and so. The, just that shared preload setting is the one you need to change at start time, but there's other settings that control, you know, what threshold or if it should even run at all. And so that's why I would just make sure that you enable it, even if you turn it off again, right? Just so that then you can turn it on if needed without the restart. I think apart from that, the good news is from a diagnostics perspective, most things that I can think of right now are changeable without a restart. Um, so there are some things that I would enable that are more around logging and just logging more things. So for example, it's helpful, like suppose this has auto vacuum logs. Um, and auto vacuum, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, is kind of that process in Postgres where it cleans up dead rows, right? So like as you're updating and deleting things, um, they leave behind these dead rows and tables. And then, you know, that's just how Postgres's MVCC model works. And then Postgres cleans those up using auto vacuum. And so understanding when auto vacuum is not working is very helpful. Um, and so there isn't lock there's a setting called log auto vacuum min duration, which you can just set to zero, which means any auto vacuum process, the, the results essentially get logged. And I find that really helpful because it kind of gives you the, you know, kind of, you know what's going on essentially. And you can just look at the logs to, to see what happened. Apart from that, the one other thing that comes to mind right now is around temporary files. Um, so there's log temp file settings, um, which essentially tells you, you know, when a query has to spill 
to disk. So essentially, like let's say a query tries to do a sort or a hash operation, and the in-memory space that it is, it's allowed to use is not big enough, and so it has to do it right to disk to essentially temporarily, you know, save that somewhere else. And that can be quite expensive in terms of I/O, and so it's important to you know know when that happens and so lock time files will tell you that. A lot of these changes for people who aren't familiar with databases and their internal workings and the ways that they came to be how they are, it can seem very esoteric and arbitrary. And most of the database engines that are in common use, particularly for transactional workloads, have been around for decades. They've gone through many iterations. They've gone through significant evolution in their design and their usage. I'm wondering what are some of the lessons that we have learned communally as an industry from running these systems over the years and some of the ways that that has influenced the ways that we think about some of the performance characteristics, some of the tuning parameters, some of the ways that the engine itself should be responsible for its own well-being that we're carrying forward either into successive versions of the same engines or in new database systems that are being designed and deployed. I think it's a good question. I would say that Postgres is probably one of the more conservative ones out there in terms of adopting new technology, right? So I think, and, and, and there's, there's a couple of reasons for that, right? But I think, so if you look at, you know, what's new and exciting in databases, you're not going to find it in Postgres for the most part. <laughs> like maybe, maybe you'll find it. So I think the one thing that Postgres has, which allows some of that, you know, new work to happen in Postgres is extensions, right? So extensions in Postgres let you modify a lot of things that the core system then doesn't have to do. But I think the from so a good example of this, just as a quick side note, would be PG Vector. So, you know, these days there's a lot of specialized vector databases, which you know they're based on a lot of recent research right around embeddings and such. Um, and so Postgres um, does not have any built-in logic for that, but there's an extension called PG Vector, which essentially makes Postgres a vector database. And you know, when that was released, and you know, ML and AI is all the craze, um, like around last year, you know, everybody started adopting it. Like all the big cloud providers offer PG Vector as a built-in extension now because people are wanting to use it, right? But Postgres itself still doesn't have anything special that, you know, it doesn't the core engine to support that. I think what's interesting to note there, right, just in terms of how Postgres works is that it's conservative because it's ultimately, like, sometimes in, you know, like, if you look at our database, let's, let's say Oracle and MySQL, right? There are sometimes things where Oracle kind of makes a strong push for certain things. Like they have like MySQL Heatwave, which is like their, you know, fancy auto-tuning kind of logic that they have. Like if you use Oracle Cloud, then you can use their Heatwave auto-tuning logic. And I'm sure it's great. I've never used it, but, you know, I'm sure it's great. And it's that kind of stuff that in Postgres world doesn't really happen with Postgres itself, right? Because there is no single entity behind Postgres that drives those, you know, kind of non-core experiences. I mean, it's, it's, in a sense, it is a core experience, right? But it's not the core engine, right? It's not the, the executor, the planner that's changing. It's in this case, you know, just some logic around it. And so really what we see in the Postgres world, I would say, is that instead of, you know, the core team adopting these changes, it's, you know, providers like Amazon, like Google, like Azure, um, building their own variant, right? Like we can see like AWS has Aurora, um, Google has LIDB. And so I think what's fascinating there to me is that, like just how, how much... Uh, scale Postgres has gotten, right? Because it's just such a good base to build on, essentially, right? Like it's very hackable. Um, it's, you know, fully open source. Um, you can influence the community direction if you, you know, kind of spend time on it, right? If you pay people to work on a project, there's, you know, a good chance that you can at least contribute some of the things back. And so I think that has really given it a way to, you know, kind of um, have the longevity here. But I do think that, you know, if, if I look at, you know, database communities, research conferences, and you're like, you know, here's the next best algorithm that, you know, really changes the, how executors should work or how planners should work. It will take some time for Postgres to adopt that, I would say. There are also interesting developments that are maybe external to the database engine. One that comes to mind is the Ottertune project from Andy Pavlo and uh, some of his research at Carnegie Mellon, where it will do some of the analysis of the runtime, some of the logs that are available in the database engine. Uh, I believe it works on things like Postgres, MySQL, and a few other engines. And then it will either just recommend these are some of the configuration parameters that you should tune, or uh, if you're feeling adventurous, even do some of the tuning for you. And I'm wondering what you have seen as some of the general adoption of tools like that or any other tools in the ecosystem that are trying to alleviate some of the burden of the end user of the database having to know all of the details of how the database works to be able to run it most efficiently and effectively for their workloads. 
Yeah, I think it's quite interesting, right? Like, so I've, I'll caveat this with saying I'm not an expert in what they're doing. Um, I think it's interesting, but I haven't used it myself. So I'll, <laughs> I'll preface it with that. I think what I've seen and heard from people is I think they're, they're interested in that. People want that, that level of automatic tuning, but they're also worried that these systems kind of make changes that they don't understand, right? So like, I think that's really, and like one of the things I did see just as an outsider from what Autotune did is like over the time that they, you know, made it a commercial project is they added more like guardrails around, you know, changes not being applied automatically, but you kind of, you know, get a way to kind of approve them, right? Um, and so I think to me, it comes back to, we want systems that take that reduce the overhead, the work, like the cognitive overhead before working with database technology is hard, right? So we, I think we all want systems that make that better, but I don't think people just want things that, you know, change things automatically. I think people want some level of control over that in the most part um, because databases are so important, right? Like you just have one of them in many cases, right? So if your database, you know, suddenly does something unexpected, that's actually often a really big problem. And so I think that's something that I don't think has been overcome yet. Um, but I do see a lot of premise in that. And I think, you know, our our own take on this, right? So like we're um, a little bit competing, but not directly. Like we don't do much parameter tuning today in PGNLyze, um, but index like recommendations as mentioned that's for us really where we see you know a big opportunity to just do better than the default which is you know somebody taking like back of a napkin and trying to you know kind of sketch out which query uses which index you know how should i optimize this um and i think that that you know um those type of systems will really you know essentially save a lot of time make people work better focus on you know the actual problems they want to solve um and not worry too much about these you know minute details and then a lot of the primary use cases for Postgres is as a transactional engine. There are extensions that you can bring into it to make it applicable to analytical use cases, but there are also a whole suite of analytical databases that are architecturally separate. And I'm curious what you see as some of the challenges or confusion that people run into when they are maybe trying to use their transactional database in an analytical context or vice versa. Yeah, and I would, you know, I would say if if you have like if you have a workload that's not a good fit for Postgres, it's probably not a good idea to use Postgres. Right? So like I, I do essentially think that there is there's cases where one can go too far and trying to use one technology for everything. And I think, you know, Postgres is pretty good at it, but you know, there are definitely cases where it's not good um, in that sense. I think the most clear example that I would reference is, you know, columnar based versus row based, right? So like that's I mean, so for context, Postgres does have a way to do columnar storage, like Citus extension can do columnar storage. Um Hydro, which is based on the columnar extension for Citus, can also do columnar. Um so and there's I think other things in Cream Plum and such. And so I think Postgres, for example, could do column storage for you, but it will most likely never be as efficient as ClickHouse is at that, for example, right? And so the question I would ask myself is, do I have a system that is really best suited for columnar and it's just columnar type data? Then I would probably use a specialized database for that, right? Because then you don't have all that overhead that Postgres has ultimately will still have around, you know, all the other systems it's running. But if I have a, a workload where I need a combination of that, right? So let's say I have an app and in my app, there's a portion of this that's more like analytics type functionality. Then I think it's really interesting to essentially use Postgres as one database versus having to manage two different like running Postgres and ClickHouse, for example, means you have to now think about probably two different providers that offer those for you, um, two different ways of optimizing things, two different ways of, you know, understanding career performance. And so that's where I think it's probably a good idea to, you know, try to use one database if you can, but then do recognize when you have specialized workloads and do change which database you're using in those stations. And in your work as an application developer, as an engineer, as somebody who is working in the Postgres ecosystem to help bring to light some of these performance problems in the engine, what are some of the most interesting or innovative or unexpected ways that you've seen people trying to address this problem of database performance? I, I mean, I think the, the one thing I will, I will say is that, is that there is... I think more recently, there is in the Postgres space, there is some efforts around, funnily enough, what MySQL has had over the years already. Um, so if you remember, MySQL had like MyISAM and then InnoDB, right? So different storage engines. And so ultimately, I think most people sent it around InnoDB and then maybe rocks, uh, like MyRocks, I think is also one thing you could use. Um, not, not a MySQL person myself, but so Postgres actually has, um, you know, as of I think Postgres 12 has a way to do um, 
So Postgres for a long time has, was able to do custom index access methods, so custom index types, essentially. But uh, more recently, Postgres can also do custom storage, right? And so coming back to columnar store, that's one way of, you know, kind of doing custom storage. But another way that's, I think, much more fundamental, like there's a project called AureoloDB, which tries to essentially do a lot of things better at the same time, which unfortunately also makes it hard to actually get to the point where it's production ready. Um, but what AureoloDB does, amongst other things, is it, so Postgres, if you remember, um, if you're familiar with it, um, has transaction IDs, right? And so one of the biggest problems, so to say, for people operating Postgres at scale can be that they have a high rate of transaction ID consumption. And so they need to run a lot of auto vacuum processes because otherwise Postgres will run out of transaction IDs. And if you look back, you know, over the years, you'll find, you know, especially in the early, you know, 2010 and, and following years, you'll see all these production outages where people had, you know, like Postgres stopped and, you know, they had to like do multiple hours of maintenance. And the good news is most of that is gone these days because it's better defaults in Postgres, but there's still situations where that can be a problem. And so what AureoloDB, for example, tries to do currently, it's a fork of Postgres. Um, it tries to essentially replace the, the core storage method, essentially, like how things are stored in the tables um, to you know, solve a lot of these problems at once. And so I think it's really promising, but also, you know, the diff essentially between the Oriolity before and the actual core Postgres is a very big diff. And so that's really where, you know, the struggle often is, is then, you know, how do you make that into smaller pieces that, you know, can actually be merged back into the main Postgres tree versus, you know, kind of because they're big ideas, because they're big changes, they're essentially have to live separately for a long time, um, which is a challenge. And in your own work of operating in this space, digging deep into Postgres and understanding its performance characteristics, what are some of the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned? Um, let's see, what is... I think, you know, I'll start by saying sometimes it is the simple things, right? So like coming back to indexes, like it was a problem yesterday. I deployed some new code. You should maybe question, you know, whether I should be writing code sometimes because I have a team working for me now. So, you know, sometimes, you know, I write that code and that's maybe not a good idea. Um, but so I deployed some code and there was a missing index. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes, you know, the things you run into is as simple as just missing an index, right? And just not having thought about it because you just you wrote a SQL query, but you didn't think about covering some part of it with an index. And so I think oftentimes it does come back to that for me personally. I do think that one of the things that I often come back to, and I referenced this earlier, right, is this idea of kind of how is the data flowing and what are you essentially asking a database to do? Like oftentimes when I see like a bad performance, like a slow query, I would look at the explain plan and I would see, you know, why are we fetching a million records here, right? And it would come down to sometimes that, you know, in our system, like with PG Analyst itself, essentially for the internal database, which is also Postgres, some customers just have databases with lots of records, essentially we're looking at, like in, in our case, queries, for example, right? So they have a lot of unique queries that they're tracking. And so then what happens is that these outliers oftentimes, you know, would would be these situations where they have a lot of queries. And so then the question is is really more, do we need to store that data, right? Is it is it right? Like, is somebody actually going to be able to look at a million queries, right? Like they're not going to be able to work with that, right? And so... Oftentimes these, you know, problems that start as a slow query, then for me become a what's happening with the data model or why do we have this data or why do we have a million records? And so then I think what really helps, and I think this comes back to, you know, thinking about who is working on this, right? If I was just the Postgres expert in the team, just the data engineer, I maybe wouldn't know what the application needs to do, right? Like these surprising situations where you suddenly have a million records where you expect that a thousand, for example, right? Like I wouldn't know if that's expected or not. And so I think if you are in a large organization, right, if you don't have that knowledge within a single head, like mine in this case, um, what you should do, right, is really try to work like across these kind of um, departments in a sense, right? It's like if there is a problem where there's a slow query, I think it's very important that the application engineer who knows what's expected and the data engineer or data platform engineer, they sit together and they are like, is this expected that there are a million records here? Or do we think that that needs to be fixed on the application side? And in those contexts, too, it's also useful to bring in tools like Great Expectations or other frameworks that allow you to collaborate in a shared space without necessarily having to always be in tight communication so that everybody can share that responsibility of understanding what are the contextual expectations of this database, of this table, of these pieces of data, so that you can have some of those assertions as part of your runtime without always having to manually say, oh, hey, this isn't working. Now I need to go dig into why. It could just be something that says, oh, hey, something's weird. You should look at it. 
Exactly. Yeah. And it, one thing we added recently with Peach Analyze is um, we integrated with OpenTelemetry for essentially exporting some of the data that we have into APM systems, right? So oftentimes as an application engineer, you wouldn't work with a specialized tool like Peach Analyze. You would work in your new Relic or, you know, your Datadog, your Honeycomb. And so what we've uh, added recently to Peach Analyze is a way for Peach Analyze to say when it has a slow execution plan, it can actually send that into your tracing system, like into your, let's say, Honeycomb, for example. I could look at my trace in Honeycomb and I can actually see the actual slow span from the database and there's a backlink into pg analyze to then you know dig deeper and see index recommendations and whatnot but it becomes a way for application engineers to see that performance issue from their world right like from the application side versus them having to kind of look start somewhere else that's definitely a very useful aspect of it too is just bring the information into the tools in the context where the person is expecting to find it rather than making them do their own exploration and ultimately come to find the problem but waste a lot of time in the process. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and as you continue to build and iterate on PG Analyze and engage with the Postgres and the database community, what are some of the things that you personally have as wishes or goals for the future of databases and the ways that they are uh, engineered and deployed and maintained? So I, I think like there, there's many, many aspects to this. One aspect that I, I personally truly care about is like, I think we need to have less databases that are run as startups or by single companies. I think it's, I mean, it's in, in a way it's exciting, right? Like that's how you can fund people to work on the problem. So in a sense, that's good. But I do think that there is a big risk where like people, like there's new startups coming out, they make a new database technology, then, you know, they become big, they try to make money with it. They try to, you know, restrict licenses. It's it's the same spiel all over again, right? Like it just keeps happening. Like, like this whole license issue in particular. And so... That's what I really appreciate about Postgres, and I wish we could adopt this for more database technology, is that there is a community that's not a single company community, right? Like it is a, like in the Postgres case, right? There's people from AWS, people from Microsoft, people from GCP, people from, you know, smaller companies, consulting shops that all work in that database together. And that gives me, you know, confidence that database is going to be around in 10 years and there's not going to be any, you know, weird license terms attached to it. And so I think what I would really love to see is see that approach adopted for more of the other database technologies, right? ClickHouse is a good example. So ClickHouse, you know, is open source, but they have started to commercialize their offering more. And so now some of the offerings that ClickHouse has are only in the cloud version. And we're starting to see some discussions in the open source side where they're like, well, are you going to be adding this? And if I make a PR that adds this feature to the open source version, would you accept the PR, right? And so the problem is the governance, like by the project being the corporation, actually limits the what the database can become. Absolutely. Are there any other aspects of the work that you're doing on PG Analyze or this overall question of database performance analysis and resolution that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, I will maybe echo again. It's just software. You know, you can like... Think of, think of your database as part of your application, right? It's so like, I mean, yes, there's a network boundary and yes, you know, it, it does like this weird SQL and then, you know, it does this planning stuff, but ultimately, you know, it's causing function calls to happen and then data to be loaded, like files to be read. And so I think demystifying that and like not thinking about it as a separate entity, but really thinking about it as part of your application logic is how I would approach database technology in particular Postgres in the context of, you know, a, um, typical web application, for example. Yeah, it's definitely useful to call that out and uh, get rid of some of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that exists around this black box of that's where the data goes and hopefully it doesn't disappear. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yes <laughs> all right well for anybody who wants to get in touch with you and follow along with the work that you're doing i'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes and as the final question i'd like to get your perspective on what you see as being the biggest gap in the tooling or technology that's available for data management today i think that i think it's a it's a user experience gap still right so coming back to what i said earlier i think we need more people with a design or a user research background working on database technology. And it's really hard, right? Because that's not easy to understand. And so the overlap of like designers and database people is very small. But, you know, I think that's really what I would like to see more of. And, you know, that will ultimately result in better tooling, right? I don't know which exact tooling, but I think just the fact that we need more people thinking about, you know, user experience in the context of database tooling is, I think, most important. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me, share your experiences working in this problem space of database performance, the work that you're doing on PG Analyze to make it more scrutable. Uh, definitely appreciate the time and energy that you and your team are putting into that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you for hosting. 
Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out our other shows, podcast.init, which covers the Python language, its community, and the innovative ways it is being used, and the Machine Learning Podcast, which helps you go from idea to production with machine learning. Visit the site at dataengineeringpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at dataengineeringpodcast.com with your story. And to help other people find the show, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends and coworkers.